Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hannah Katerin. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and she, her. And I'm the assistant curator at the Fralin Museum of Art at the University of Virginia. Um, the University of Virginia and the city of Charlottesville stand on the traditional territories and homelands of the Monacan Nation. I could not be more excited um, for tonight's program, which is in conjunction with our installation Focus on Laura Aguilar, which features um, four works by Laura that, we that were recently acquired by the museum and is on view through June 19th. Um, so you're, if, if you're in Charlottesville or you find yourself down for a road trip to Virginia, um, please come, um, come by and see them in person. Um, I have just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speaker. Um, there will be time following um, Christopher's talk for questions, um, so if you could please submit those via the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Also, this talk is being recorded um, and will be available on our YouTube channel in the near future, so if you know someone who is really bummed that they're missing it, <laughs> they'll be able to catch it again on our YouTube. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our brilliant speaker, um, artist and co-trustee of the Laura Aguilar Trust, Christopher Valesco. Christopher Anthony Valesco is a photographer and performance artist who lives and works in Los Angeles. His work emphasizes the queer brown body and incorporates horror and camp aesthetics. Christopher earned a BFA from California Institute of the Arts and a Master of Fine Arts from UC Santa Barbara. As a Getty Morrow undergraduate intern, Valesco interned at the Santa Monica Museum of Art and UCLA's Chicana Studies Research Center and Library. Valesco is an instructor at the California State Summer School of Arts, and his work has been featured in exhibitions at Art Center College of Design, ADNA Museum, Avenue 50 Studios, California Institute of the Arts, Hibbleton Gallery, the Getty Museum, and the Vincent Price Art Museum. In addition, he has also performed with Harry Gambo Jr. with Virtual Verite, Los Angeles Union Station, UC Santa Barbara, and Last Projects. And we are all set. Take it away, Chris. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, intro. I always remind myself of the change it because it just sounds long-winded sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you to the Friendly Museum and to Hannah uh, for bringing me on to talk about um, Laura Aguilar, who, you know, as some, some people would know, I am the co-trustee along with Sybil Veganetas, who uh, we run Laura's archive, uh, in, you know, uh, trust as Laura left it to you know, to make sure to we preserve her legacy. And in doing that, we have um, tried to make sure we uh, get, the, uh, get her work to, you know, be acquired into institutions. That was one of her wishes. And so happened that the Freyland acquired, uh, was it four or five? I don't remember. <laughs> Four. <laughs> it was four, yeah. It, it's so long. It feels like a long time ago in pandemic times. But um, yeah, so what Hannah wanted, suggested is that I come in and, and just talk about Laura's work, um, you know, from my perspective, and also give a little bit of like behind the scenes, a little bit of the trust and what we do. Uh, so a lot of images you may recognize, some you may not. But what I plan to do is just give like a, a greatest hits of Laura's. Um, work because you know there's so much and in doing this work we still are finding a lot more work that hasn't been talked about or seen so you know it's just one of those long journeys that myself uh that I got involved with and in having Laura bringing me on so um and also I just want to let people know too is always like a this is not going to be a pure it's not going to be an academic talk uh I always try to pride myself in just talking as uh, honest and direct as Laura would, because I've seen Laura talk in many different uh, places and she was very honest and very open, but not the, <laughs> she didn't talk academic talk. So this is my way of just kind of like, you know, paying a mosh to her too, saying, hey, this is what my perspective is and her work. And also, you know, maybe give some insights too, because I've got to sit down and talk with Laura for a long time before she passed uh, about her work and life. So as uh, if everybody has no <laughs> objections, <laughs> I'll just go and uh, let's share my screen and uh, let's see if this works. All right, so everybody could see that. 
uh, now we'll go to uh, the intro. So what I want to start off with is that, you know, Laura's work really kind of started with self-portrait. And even though she was a very shy person, I mean, shy, didn't really, you know, talk to people. She was very, you know, to herself. And this was also because she was, um, she had auditory dyslexia. Um, she had a lot of like learning disabilities with her growing up and it took a long time. She said it took uh, maybe a couple years when she was at East LA College. And then eventually she went to Pasadena City College and there they found, they're like, hey, let's test you. And this was like in the eighties, it was like 82, I believe, where she figured out that she has dyslexia. And, you know, at the time, nobody knew this when she was growing up in high school and all that. So, you know, for her, it was like a, a struggle because she couldn't communicate the way she wanted to. So in a way she found, or photography found her in a way and helped her uh, gain confidence in taking pictures and also getting, uh, taking pictures of other people. In the beginning of Laura's career, she would do a lot of self-portraits, but not, uh, and also portraits of others. And this was her way to, again, to gain confidence uh, with others and with herself. And, you know, this is just an early, early image of Laura and self-portrait. There's plenty of others, but I think for the talk, this was a great one, because this is also at her house uh, that is no longer her house, because, you know, uh, her nephew got the property and then he sold it. So, but that's a different story. So this is uh, her back. There's like, um, there was a garage and this is her back uh, house where it was a separate like studio, had a bathroom and before she passed on and when we were constantly going over and meeting with her, she stored all her toys in this place. I mean, toys. And I say toys as because it's like so many toys. Laura was kind of a toy hoarder. But <laughs> It was also kind of fun because, you know, she loved collecting toys, especially uh, female figures from Xena, Warrior Princess to, you know, uh, Wonder Woman. That was her favorite. So then we go on to in late 80s and the 80s was like a really strong, like prolific time for Laura. And then there's other periods and the like, other decades that were also strong. But the 80s was this kind of coming out in a way because she also found, you know, she she kind of came terms with her her sexuality, uh, identifying as a lesbian. Uh, it took also in the late 80s that she also identified as Chicana. And again, that took a long time for her to realize that because, you know, there were so many different uh, ter uh, terms for, you know, Chicana. And, the, and then with the 70s and 80s with the Chicano movement, a lot of people were still trying to find that identity. And I think that's like what you could say prevalent to now, how everybody now is trying to find an identity with like, you know, how to label themselves if they want to go Latin X, you know, so it's like, you know, we always go through these phases. And I think with Laura, she was kind of going back in the 70s, 80s. And then when she discovered, okay, I'm a lesbian, I'm Chicana. And then that's how she identified herself to the, like if she was still with us, she would say I'm a Chicana and a lesbian and, you know, not really queer. Cause I think nowadays people would want to label her queer, but then, you know, it's just the terminology and that's just like the way of the generations. And this uh, work in particular is uh, a self portrait from the Latina lesbian series. This was a five year span that she did, uh, I think five or six. And she would uh, photograph, she wanted to photograph women who were strong, independent, working, you know, trying to showcase a positive side to what, you know, uh, what people would think of, you know, being a woman, being Chicana, being possibly lesbian, and and so forth. And also, she did a lot of her the printing. This is all combination printing. So she would take the picture. She would write. Uh, have the her. She wrote the text, or had the other um, model write the text, and then she put it together and sandwiched them in the, in the darkroom. So it's a it's a one. It's a combination print of like I think three different exposures onto one. Uh, print and was interesting she was very inspired by Dwayne Michaels who was kind of a contemporary at the time of her because they were at the same maybe a little older I, I'm not sure of the dates of them but he did the same kind of similar uh, series where he had he took portraits of friends family and then he had 
uh, but he, uh, the uh, Dwayne would write himself onto the photographs. So Laura just was inspired by this and decided to do it herself in her own way, which is having the models and herself write their own text. So she photographed that and then had the, the background or, you know, in this case, she had the Lotaria and, you know, combination prints. You would see this kind of style that uh, get developed into other series later on. And then it just went to more straightforward um, photography as like, you know, documenting herself in the landscape. So this is another series that I guess sometimes doesn't get talked about. It's been a little bit of rediscovery here and there. And this is the Day of the Dead portraits from 1989. This was taken at the Alley Center of, of Alley Cent Alley Center of Photography in here in Los Angeles. Funny thing is that uh, this was all Laura's background. <laughs> She did, uh, she had the background. She designed the coffin. Uh, this was also inspired by an image by Judy Dater that had like a, a coffin in the background, kind of like these portraits. And she just had, and you know, friends and family would come by. They had this is the during the Day of the Dead in November, probably November first, second, and third. And she would photograph them, and they would just be and. And there's about, I think, 20, no, 16 images that she printed herself from the negatives. When we looked at the negatives, there's a lot more images, but of course she picked what she wanted to pick. And, you know, when, when during with the trust, when we're scanning stuff too, it's like, oh, maybe down the road, that could be a book. But again, this is all different. This is like down, <laughs> that's like, we have to wait till things, you know, move forward with, with other projects and whatnot. So here, um, here is her good friend, Yadena Cervantes, who's an amazing painter herself. Uh, the two, other, I, I don't know who the two other people are, but it's funny because I, like looking at these portraits, I'm like, I recognize some people and then I don't. Sybil would have to come and say, oh, that's this person, this person. And what was fascinating with Laura too, when she was doing portraits, if she took portraits of other people, she always got a model release. So, and that's an important thing when, you know, doing photography and doing uh, taking portraits of people, you know, you want to have a model release or some kind of agreement saying, hey, down the road, if something comes up and it gets into a show, gets sold, you know, let that the model know, or if you're going to show it, because, you know, sometimes people get very weird about having their images out, you know, in public or in, in some kind of way. Now we move on to the late 80s and early 90s, and there's this is Laura's like almost magnum opus. No, not really, it's kind of like getting there. It's kind of like the, the precursor. Um, this is the Insani's room, the famous Insani's room. This is a large print. I didn't, put the, the, I didn't put the size on this because there's two versions. There's a 1620 uh, smaller print that she did. And, and then the original one that she uh, created was uh, in a mural for the a mural size print. This was about, 52 by 42 inches. You'll see the, the size of that later on, a little uh, shortly where, you know, how big it was. Now this one, um, of course, Laura always was a keen, she had, was keen to the history of art and photography. And this was her kind of, kind of playing off the Odalisque and kind of saying, okay, let's do the, you know, the woman, but also kind of relaxing and being like playful. And this is also funny too, because even though she did a lot of her own self portraits early in her career, later on, she always had an assistant later. Uh, you can see the, the photo cord, the, the cable release cord right here in the photo. Um, and I, I know when coming up in my own photography career, some people would frown on that, you know, commercially or if not, but here you are, Laura doing it herself, lounging with the fan, uh, and also drinking a Diet Pepsi because that was one of her favorite drinks. So, and this was I learned too as hanging out with her. She always get a Diet Pepsi. So here you go, uh, Laura. Like again, really getting sort of comfortable, kind of exploring the body, exploring herself, finding what is truth for her and photography. Because you know, most of the time, you know, you see, you see photographs of. Uh, mostly women too, they're, you know, they're nude, but they're always of like a certain body type, you know, a certain way. And her, she wanted to kind of represent, this is who I am. She's just being comfortable, being playful. You're going to see this like progression of the nude 
as you know, we go on to Laura's work, but it's going to look different and it's going to have different interpretations. And of course, many people have written about the, the you know, the Sani's Room or the other works, but, you know, to me, this is her, for me, this is her kind of the most casual, the most playful, the most honest. And then in, 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 uh, the next work, you know, here we go, it's more politically charged, it's more about identity. Uh, this is the Three Eagles Flying, and this work has been like, oh my God, it's written, written so much and so talked about in so many different ways. And um, for Laura, you know, she, this was about growing up and having a, a Mexican father and a, a, an American uh, mother who was like, you know, Irish kind of Italian uh, mother growing up and she had red hair. So it was a lot of this, you know, trying to figure out who she was and she's, she's trying to, you know, and this was also, again, going back to Laura trying to figure out her ident her national identity. What is it? Is it Chicano? Is it, Ch or Chicana? Is it like American? Is she a Mexican American? Because that term also changed. It was Mexican American, then he went to Chicana. Then, you know, and it evolves as most uh, things do. And to, to most, history of photograph, uh, photography, I would say this is Laura's like iconic, important, like if it was like, you know, it's the, it's already canonized. This image is already canonized compared to more of the other works, but this is the one that you say Laura Aguilar in a history of, you know, class, this is the image that comes up. But what's funny for me, I think in Sandy's room should be there too, because of the, the more of the art history, you know, canon behind it, like the Odalis, where this is just, it's its own image, its own like identity and speaks to what Laura was about. But then again, Laura did so many different things that this was not only her one type of image. Um, what's funny about this too, is that uh, a, a friend of hers who was a model in another series wrote about this work and was talking about like bondage and Laura freaked out and said, no, it's not about bondage, it's not about this. And she just was like so upset with her for a little bit. And then they, you know, she go, and then she's like, I'm not gonna talk to you. And then she started talking to her again. It's just, that's how Laura's uh, personality was. Um, she always mentioned that too. She's like, oh, you know, this person wrote about this. And I go, yes, I know. But to her, it just like, it stayed with her because again, this is not what the work was about. This was, you know, her battling her identity, being tied between the two, but, you know, sometimes you have to like try to calm Laura down when she gets upset and she would just be like, no, and I go, okay, yes, and just agree with her so she could like chill and <laughs> chill out and like, you know, we move on to the next thing. So three eagles flying and it's also like Aguilar in Spanish actually means three eagle, you know, three eagles flying. So it's a kind of an interesting piece and name. Then we go into a more like one of her, well, she has other bodies of work that is like, there's so many images, but as a series, this one, Clothe and Clothe, is the most. She has 35 portraits, uh, like diptychs of a person clothed and unclothed. This was all shot on Polaroid type film. So this is a type of Polaroid that you could peel away and you get a negative and a positive. So, and that's why you get kind of like this uh, nice, um, like jagged edge, because it's the film, it's the way the film was peeled off. This was again inspired by so many different artists, uh, Judy Dater again, also Helmut Newton, who did that famous uh, naked and dressed uh, image from 1981. So again, uh, and, and I, I will mention, Laura was a student of uh, art and photography. She knew who she was referencing and inspired by, and she always wanted to make it her, like in her own uh, way, in her own concept. And, this is number one, this is, you know, herself. And then it gets to, this was a long series that spanned till 1994. And the last image is Willie Middlebrook and his uh, children, which is um, in 1994. This is, again, this is one of those series that's so iconic and is so important because she has, not only herself, she photographed a lot of her for friends, um, family, some family, there's, I think two, two sets of people that are family, the rest are all friends, some artists. Um, it's kind of like, it's it's just one of those series because like when I was I'd been doing the inventory and looking and then learning about who's who, because she wrote down the list of whose uh, numbers. And so Laura was also very 
about archives so she knew what to save what not to save she saved mostly everything she made duplicates of um photograph uh, these uh, smaller prints the negatives uh, she made copies just to have like a photocopy and also of the model releases just in case because you never know when somebody's going to come back and say oh well you know I didn't want this image and it's like well sorry we have the model release <laughs> yeah that's just kind of like a crazy thing um now here is an image that I think most people have never seen is the how Mexican is Mexican originally this is how this, the work is supposed to be. It's an installation with the photographs. But when we did it for the show and tell exhibition, there was not a lot of space. So we had to kind of limit what was going in. So this was actually, I think back in 1993 in Texas somewhere. I have to, I'm not sure exactly where, but this is the, the way that the installation was, it was supposed to be like an installation. Every photograph, every panel, of the person who has their image in here has um, items as like a an offering or is it kind of like a you know offering a thank you and it kind of explains who they are as a person without being there then the image and then the text these uh these are all uh yeah these it's a large panel because there's nine single like single panels uh i re we recently uh had to deframe them because the original frames are so like they were metal and glass and it was not fun and pretty, but we had to because it just like it took up space too, unfortunately, with the trust. So uh, yeah, this is a rare treat because nobody's ever seen what it looks this uh, series as it's supposed to look. But in the show and tell exhibition, we you just saw the just the uh, images themselves and the frames and kind of spaced away. They were supposed to be grouped together. Now we move on to, again, the prolific 90s again for Laura was uh, Plush Pony. And this again is another, um, she's not in the work, she's taking pictures of these um, people at this Plush Pony bar in El Sereno. And so with, she set up the background, she brought that background and <laughs> what's funny is that I think it's from East LA College too. It's one of those like it, she, I think she got or she found it or she like put more paint on it to have like a simple background because it's actually blue and purple and kind of like really 80s kind of like funky. But in black and white, it looks a simple backdrop, but that's how Laura was. She had a camera, she always had her lighting kit. Um, and a lot of the equipment she had was either borrowed or some uh, friends of hers would give it to her or like help her get um, funding to get these uh, paper and supplies. So Laura was always dependent on, in a way, from the kindness of all her friends or and as she got grants. That's how she kind of uh, worked. She never really had the money to do it on her own. She never had a normal job. It was always being an artist. And with the Plush Pony series, which is iconic because she wrote about it in some of her journal writing that, you know, she never really felt comfortable in a place like this because this bar in particular, um, being a lesbian bar, was more about like butch and femme. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of the butch and then the, kind of the femme. And Laura never really kind of, I don't know if she understood this or just was not really vibing with it. And, you know, I guess for myself too, I, re I can relate to her talking about this because I never really fit into a lot of, you know, the, the gay scene or like the, you know, the cool, the cool, the cool kids, as I call them, and the cool art scene too. It's like everybody has a certain aesthetic. And I just realized I'm just a nerd. And I think Laura was also a nerd too, because she loved um, superhero movies, uh, comics, stuff like that. She like we used to go to the movies a lot with to go see like all the the marvel movies in the last like you know we just go in she'll get a popcorn we're just eating and just like you know laugh or watch them she's like oh that was entertaining because it was just simple and fun just to watch and i think with this kind of a place too you know there's this hierarchy of like okay are you a butch are you femme there's no in between and i think that was kind of maybe maybe and i guess i'm just speaking for myself is that it could be confusing whereas you know there, I mean, I think now there's a little bit more of like, it's just so broad and so like all over where we could fit in however, but again, she just, I don't think she really fit in and she wrote about it and she took the pictures and there's model releases and who knows if these uh, women are still around or with, you know, we don't know. Um, 
So it's, it would be a fascinating thing to kind of see if they're still around, but then of course that's, you know, that's money that, you know, some of us just don't have time to spend. Then we go on to, uh, again, going back into the nudes and this in particular set is the 12 Loras. These are 12 large, uh, at least 20 by, I think it's 20 by 16 or is it a little bigger? I'm not, I, I kind of, it's hard to remember a lot of the different sizes, but they're pretty, they're all individually printed. They're all together. Um, the way that you display them is um, you could have uh, we, we decided to just go individually framed and then put together to create the large grid. That's how Laura wanted. This was also, she did this when she got the residency at Lightwork um, photo um, artist in residency in New York or Buffalo. This was also, I just recently found this out, which is kind of fascinating, is that she was inspired by one of the images that Willie Middlebrook took the previous year, because he had convinced her to do this residency. She got in and the images, because I, I was speaking to Lightwork and I found out what, they were giving me all the information because I just wanted to know what they have there as far as their collection. They said that they sent me her, uh, her application and she submitted the three eagles flying and in sandy's room to get the the residency which is like mind-blowing because can you imagine being like on the end of you're like holy shit and they're physical prints the small eight by ten she gave them physical prints so she was there she was doing a lot of printing and she created this this body work called the 12 floras and again what i found out was that this was in uh, conversation to willie middlebrook's 12 photographs of himself that LACMA has in their collection, because I, I just saw that at the Golden Hour show, um, 12 photographs of uh, Willie Middlebrook self-portraits, they're kind of bleach process. And then he was the one who also convinced her to shoot more nudes and print larger. So this kind of like um, collaboration with like one artist to another, which is really fascinating because I wish myself, I knew Willie, but then through Laura, I knew Willie because you know he was also inspir uh, inspirational in my own uh, work later on in my own career. Uh, so this is the 12 Loras. And then also she was doing some practice shots of the nude, of herself nude in nature, because I think she kind of had a feeling that she wanted to do this. And here in this image is kind of like the precursor to that. How is it gonna look herself being nude? And what's fascinating about these nude exercises, you can kind of see where she was going, what she was trying to accomplish. And in most of all the, in the nudes in nature, you won't see the, the, the cable release. You, she eventually got somebody to come and assist her and photograph that. But I think it would, personally, I think it would look cool if she had the cable release in it compared to other uh, photographers like Judy Dater and other, um, Ruth Bernhardt that never had like the, the cable release. And I go, you would have really stand out if you had the cable release in it, but you know, that's what happened. So again, we're going into the prolific 93s and this is the will work for um, series. There is technically five works in this series and they all look different. Uh, number one is, I think it's will work for materials. And it's a more close-up shot of Laura holding the sign that says uh, access, you know, or will work for materials. The second one is um, will work for access, which is a more close-up image of her holding this sign. The third one is access plus opportunity equals success. And that's the five uh, herself where she's holding up access plus opportunity equals success. The fourth one is this one, which you see before you is it will work for number four, and it's at the Vincent Price Art Museum. And then the fifth one is will work for health benefits. And it's a small eight by 10 she took in front of the Church of Scientology and Hollywood Boulevard. So again, we didn't, I didn't know this about the series. I always thought they were all individual works, but then part, they're actually a part of one larger uh, series. Uh, this one, of course, is the most well-known one because it's talking about, you know, access. Access means so many different things for Laura, meaning she, again, and I mentioned it before, she never had money to burn or to 
She was always, you know, looking for money, trying to sell her work. She sold her work cheaply at the time too. She would give away stuff to and exchange for things. Um, and also the way she spells access. Again, this is, goes into the dyslexia. She had auditory dyslexia where she, when she heard, hears sounds and words and different letters, it, it, it's the same thing when you're learning uh, reading too, like words and letters kind of do this and it changes. So this was like important for her to kind of like, this is just who I am. We'll work for materials, the same thing. She never had a lot of access to a lot of things. And then the healthcare, you know, when you're a working artist and you're not really having a normal nine to five job, you're, it's, it sucks to have health benefits. And then later on, she would have like, you know, healthcare, which was Medi-Cal and it was the worst shit she could ever have. I'm sorry, I'm gonna sometimes cuss, so I apologize again, I'm not doing academic talk, so bear with me. Uh, yeah, she, it, was, it was a piece of shit because at the end of her life, the way that Medi-Cal was like messing her up, wanting to keep her alive when she had her, um, her power of a health attorney kind of uh, that kind of stuff she wanted she was like if I go off of um, dialysis just put me in hospice and we had to fight multiple doctors just to get that wish for her because she was you know they wanted to keep her alive because if she was on dialysis they get paid you know so it's like you know it's a it's a mess the whole healthcare someday if there's a documentary or something I'm gonna just like unleash about that but because it was a it was a it was a really fucked up experience uh, dealing with that and dealing with some other stuff that's associated with that. But I don't want to get into that. So next we get into the iconic nature self portrait. This is the first body of work that goes into her nature series, as what myself and Sybil would call it. Um, this is this one in particular, nature self portrait number eleven, is Laura's all time favorite image. Even though she'll say every image she did is her favorite, and I quote that because it's it's true. This one is by far her most favorite because of most of all the nudes in nature, you don't really see a lot of Laura's face. It's always the body. It's kind of turned. So here she's kind of like you know you only see profile, and here she is. She's just being comfortable. It's almost like the Sandy's room. She's just being herself here into nature. But what she also said about this work is. It was her way of like, I didn't, she wasn't nude. She was just becoming a rock. She wasn't trying to say, I'm a body. It's like, no, I'm in a way like performing as an object and saying, okay, I'm a part, I'm a tree, I'm a rock, I'm the, you know, the water. So it all, you know, she was trying, and it's like the idea of the becoming, you know, it's almost, she's not really present, but then she is. And I always felt that like fascinating especially in later work like the grounded series which you'll see in a second is that you know she was becoming into the landscape she wasn't trying to be like sexualized like in most nude photographs of women like you know being you know it was more about like just becoming and and feeling one with nature uh, here is one of the, the, the images that the Fralin has in their collection. This is Stillness number 24. Now, Stillness 24 was what we knew originally, too, was taken in uh, San Antonio, in and around San Antonio and Esper Esperanza Art Center. So there was, she had a residency to go there and create this uh, work. Stillness, and this one in particular, 24, is actually not a part of San Antonio. This is actually in the Mojave Desert. Again, we're finding out all these things with notes and things when we're going through the, the, the archive because she would say things and then, you know, sometimes she wouldn't. So we had to kind of found her, uh, go through and learn about the stuff of Laura. Still, uh, there's a set, I think there's from like stillness number 20, yeah, 24 to 32 is all these images of her in uh, the Mojave Desert and then stillness number 15 to 41 are all in Texas. I don't know why she did that, excuse me, uh, chrono chronology different. It was more of she's, I just, she just vibed with the images and did it her set herself. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do this one and then put these in here. And what I also found out too is that the reason why too she did that is like, originally these were taken first because in her film camera, 
she shot these in Mojave Desert before she left to Texas to finish the series. So that's why it's supposed to be stillness, you know, 24 is the first images, but the way she edited and wanted to be, these came after. So again, that's how Laura worked. She always was like looking at images, thinking about them, putting them together, printing them kind of like, you know, okay, this goes here, this goes here, you know. And then I want to show this is a, a rare rarity too. We found was that she actually took Polaroids at the time of herself uh, at, in Texas for the Stone Series. This was, uh, I think this was for Stillness number 41, which I'll show you what the, uh, what the print looks like. But she had so always somebody take a picture of reference for her, see what it looked like. Um, and then you go to the next one and this is what the image looks like. So she always was kind of thinking about composition, exposure, how it's supposed to look. You know, she that's how she was as a photographer. Uh, when she had assistants helping her, all they did was just press the button for her. They never really did anything more. They never said, oh, you should try this. She didn't allow for that either. And so I started working with her. And, uh, I was fighting with her about like darkroom stuff. and uh, But she understood the differences as, you know, because she all printed all the work. This is an another in the Freelance collection. This is Motion 58. Now, this series alone, the Motion series, is all with other models. There's images with Laura, of course, in it. There's some images with uh, the models themselves, and then you know, and integrated too. And this was like you know, an another. This was again going to Texas as well. I think it's where in San Antonio, but. She was, uh, she was, I think it was a women's retreat as well that she was a part of. And she invited the women, these uh, women to kind of be a part of this uh, series with her and they all agreed. And I'm like, they probably, uh, they kind of knew who probably she was or not, but this is also about movement, body. Like, you know, that's why she's being a little bit more, you know, in the body language compared to nature self-portrait and stillness she is becoming into the landscape but then it's like the body is changing because I think she was learning how to um, move her body more and also I think she was taking aerobics like in water the water aerobics class so I think it was helping her to be a little bit more loose and, and relaxed in her, in her thing then we go into later which is the center series and this one is you know I think one of my favorites too but because there's this really interesting pagan vibe I get, this more ritualistic, especially with the images of the rocks too. There's this kind of almost witchcraft, you know, and I'm just putting things into this because again, this is probably not what she was thinking, but this is what I was thinking about this work in particular. Um, here you are, this woman. And, and when you look at her image and her face and their hair, it's almost like this, it's almost neat. She has this like, otherworldly like native uh, presence and I think in her work and here she is she's just sitting and she's just doing them and she's not becoming in this this one is just totally different for me uh and then you know and then these are smaller too because at the time she couldn't afford to print these larger ants center the center series there's almost 46 images in the whole series and <laughs> Uh, we don't have them all, unfortunately, in the in the, the the estate copies because at the time she was also giving away stuff or people were keeping things when she was showing them. So it's really hard to find the full set. I mean, we have the negatives and we know which one she wanted, but we don't have the prints to kind of judge them off. Um, so again, it's, it's really rare. And then she was also working in triptychs and diptychs in this series too. So it was kind of her experimenting again with how she was trying to tell her story. Then we go to the last of the nature works. And this is actually two, which is kind of sad. This is like her last really big major body of work she did because after this period is when her health issues were kind of kicking in more and she was just kind of, you know, back and forth. She didn't really do a lot of work and this is grounded. And I picked this one because there's so many great ones in this uh, series, but this one is my favorite. Uh, because, and this was significant too, and I didn't realize until later when I was doing my thesis work, at, when I was getting a, a grad school, and I used this image to talk about some of the work I was doing, and realizing that Laura, this image is kind of like Laura's deathbed, 
And if I was thinking about psychology and I think it's a uh, Freud uh, or not Freud, the other guy, Lacan or something about, you know, how as humans, we tend to like when we were birth and we, you know, do our thing and then we end up always kind of going to our deathbed. And I found that fascinating. And then also reading some French philosophers about um, the parasite and some other uh, topics and also uh, being transcendent. And I think this image in particular, because here she is in the middle of the ground. And what's fascinating is that before, you know, when she, before she passed on, she asked us to take her ashes to Joshua Tree. And I think, again, this is very significant because this image was taken at Joshua Tree. It's not the exact image, the place that she wanted it, but it's still very like profound that she's like, oh, this is what I want and we did it. And so it's just like, oh my God, it's so crazy about this happening. And for myself too, there, uh, when I was in UC, at UC Santa Barbara, there was the fires happening in 2017. So <laughs> there is a lot of like interesting thing about fire and ashes and then the body and the landscape. So uh, <laughs> funny story about this too. She told me before she passed that she's like, you know, whatever you do, do not go nude in the landscape and to try to pay, you know, like your respects, like saying, oh, you're doing an image about Laura and you're nude and she goes, if you do that, I will come back and haunt your ass. And I hold that true because I didn't want to do that for my thesis where I did something different and, you know, about Laura, but I was like, nope, I don't want her to come back and haunt my ass because she, she has visited me and she has like, you know, told me off in, in dreams, but it's just who she was and that was our relationship. So now we're going to go into some images with the trust and what we did or what I was doing with her before the trust was really established. And these are kind of, again, behind the scenes stuff that um, uh, the Chicano Study Center would not want to see this image because this is what the time they were always in transition. They were using boxes and everywhere. So it was like a fortress of boxes. And here we are, Laura, going through her negatives and telling me what to scan or what to do later on after she's passed. like, oh, I want this image to be shown if we ever did a book. So here's the evidence of that. Here's a you know, picture of me and Laura back in 2015 when we were at the, she always liked a free meal too. If somebody, if she, somebody want to talk to her, she'd say, oh, just, you know, buy me lunch and I'll talk to you. That's how she was. Um, this is also a fun image of our, uh, Laura at her in her um, garage, and she set up a quick studio because she wanted to take pictures of her toys. There's that small series that came after Grounded, which is the toys, and it's not really like finalized because there's still so much that she wanted to do. So for the exhibition, we printed only the ones that she really wanted, and but there's really not like a final set, unfortunately. So, but then here you are, 2015, she wanted me to do a documentation for her. Uh, we fought a lot on how the lighting should be and everything, but that's, again, that was our relationship. Then I was going around with her a lot to do a lot of visiting artist talks. Here we are at Cal Arts. And again, this is how she was talking. She didn't really do like a big, you know, standing in front. She just sat next to people because again, she was shy. And then eventually when you get her to talk, she'll just start talking and, and give any kind of information. Um, here is a rare example of Laura and our relationship. She actually let me photograph her. Uh, this was this was important and, and, and humbling because again, she didn't really let a lot of people photograph her. And she had this trust with me, which again, I was like, oh my God, thank you. But the other images in this set <laughs> is Laura being a clown. She was like moving, joking. She didn't let, like, I was like, Laura, listen. And I go, let me take, like, hold still. She's like, no, you've got, I didn't realize she was also teaching me how to be quicker in my in like taking pictures of people. And I was like, no, just stand here. And then she's like, nah, nah, you know, so, and she was just like being really playful. That's how, again, that's how she was with me. So here is, I think we talked about this. Here's the Asani's room print. Look how big it is compared to like Laura and other people in the background. Uh, here is um, important uh, academic uh, instructor and writer, um, Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. Ah, it's gonna come to me. I'm sorry. It, there's Sybil being at us, I'm sorry. Uh, I should know these things. And, um, oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm drawing a blank right now and I should know this. <laughs> but this is for the home show before her big uh, exhibition. It'll come to me, I promise. So 
Clifford Chang did it instead of Amelia Jones. Amelia Jones, thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I should like get, I should like slap myself on that one. Uh, so here, here's the example of what I also was doing with Laura too uh, for the uh, upcoming show and tell exhibition. I had to print about eight images for the exhibition because we couldn't find those, Im we couldn't find the prints. One of them was the, in Sandy's room because the original print was being shown somewhere else. Uh, and it was kind of like Laura wasn't really happy with the print because it was what I found out was an artist proof. It was a rush job. So I was like, oh, OK. So they were like, v Vincent Price Art Museum was asking, it's like, oh, can we print? I'm like, yeah, just give me the negative and I can take it to a lab and get it worked on. So it's going to be, a, I go, it's going to be a digital um, fiber based print. It's going to look a little different because we're going to clean it up. And this is what I did for Laura's show, which is the, I mean, the other work I did in the dark room was important too, but for me, again, the, in Sani's room, I went and I cleaned it up and printed it and did a lot. And she didn't tell me this, but she told it to a friend, another friend of ours who said, don't tell Chris this until, you know, later. She said that, you know, she was really proud that I did the work for her and that, you know, she trusted me doing this. And, but she's like, don't tell him because I don't want it to go to his head. And I was like, you know, I could have used that too, just to kind of feel like, oh, well, thank you, you know, but of course that's how Laura was. So yeah, I had to do the, in Sandy's room, did a couple plush pony prints, uh, some portraits of artist friends. And I think there was something, oh, uh, one of the Day of the Dead portraits I had to do for the show. So here's some images of the behind the scenes that when we were uh, doing the show and tell, here again, so, so this is just what it looked like. I like to show this too, because with students who don't know what it looks like, what it looks like to go behind the scenes of like the prints and frames and putting up on the wall, how it looks. Here is the Don't Tell Her Art Can't Hurt. Uh, I just figure I showed here because it's kind of, it looks cool here and how big they are and framed. And here's the 12 Loras, how it looked. Um, and then here's an image of Laura kind of again, just, we were going to, we were constantly going back and forth to the, exp, uh, to the, sh to the museum to kind of do final runs, do final checks. Uh, and then here is uh, before, it was, I think a week before the actual opening where Laura was giving like a private tour for students and, you know, and she liked doing that too. And just note, I uh, just note all the, the very bright, bright colors that she was wearing. What I later found out is Laura was colorblind and she did not, you know, I guess she couldn't tell the tonality. And this was also, it came out when I was uh, happy. Oh, I actually had to print the Grounded series for the show. That's also another one. And when I would sit there and like, okay, Laura, look at this. What do you think? And she's like, oh, it looks fine. The tones look, you know, and I was like, tones, you mean the color? She's like, what color? I'm like, you don't see the yellow. You don't see the blues. And she's like, no, I just see the contrast. And I was like, wait. And she's like, yeah, I'm colorblind. I was like, what? Again, she she told other friends this, but she didn't tell me this. Or you know, again, she told everybody was different in her circle of friends. They're always they learn different things, and we're still learning about these things too. So, uh, here's a, a fun example of how Laura was. So Laura was in multiple shows during the Pacific Standard Time Initiative, and the, one of them was Access Mundo, queer networks of in Chicano, LA. They were showing a couple of the Latina lesbians uh, series and I think some plush pony. But when we went to the opening, Laura made sure she wanted people to see her book. So she was she was plugging her show and her book. And when people were like, oh my God, Laura, I love your work here. She's like, well, if you love it, you could look at my book and then you could see it in the show. So she was she was doing all kinds of stuff. You know, she didn't like that she was doing. It. And then here I am wearing t-shirts, trying to sell t-shirts for her. So I was trying to make her some money. So again, the two of us were just doing this, trying to, yeah. Would I do it again? Of course, I was try to like sell these tickets. But yeah, she was always kind of going around like, look at my book, look at, oh, but you know, if you like the book, you're gonna love the show. So she was, that's what she was doing. Now we go to after her passing, I wanna show this image too, because this was an important day. This is uh, where we went to spread her ashes in Joshua Tree. And here there's a lot of amazing, important people in this photo not only artists, but friends. Uh, there's Delilah Montoya, famous Chicano photographer. 
um, who else is in here? Uh, Barbara Carrasco, amazing artist and painter. And then Yerena Sibyl, myself, Clifford Pun, who was, you know, great friend to Laura, Pablo, um, Yolanda, uh, Yoli, her friend Becky. So there's a lot of like important people there. And, you know, and also it was like a 120 degrees at this day. I don't want to advise you ever going to Joshua Tree during this time because this was the only time we could get everybody to show up. They, it was hot as hell. And we kept on seeing this like white bird around us, a white rabbit kind of, then we all were laughing because we knew that Laura was also laughing at us doing this. So again, this was a really important image, but it was kind of, of course it was sad too, but I, we had to document this because we know that in the future, this would be an important image. We also, after Laura passed on, everybody wanted to do something for Laura and we got asked to go to Chicago for the National Mex Mexican Museum of Art to do an altar, but we, we asked them if we could do the altar that Laura would want instead of doing a more traditional one, which she loved doing traditional altars, but we want to do our version of this, and this is the one we did, myself and Sybil, and we use a lot of the objects from her uh, archive, you know, her t-shirt, uh, her image, the camera that she gifted me, I was like, let's put it into the show because I think that's important. Uh, funny thing was in Chicago, when we were trying to do this Southwestern motif, we went to different stores to try to find cactuses. They didn't have it. So myself and the director of the museum or the curator, we were like driving around Chicago trying to find all this stuff. And then when we when we finished it, we had to do like a docent tour to give all the docians like the information a lot of them were like what's what's a river what's a cactus because they're from chicago and they have no mountains no nothing so this was kind of funny about that so but of course this uh, altar stayed you know it was very different from the other traditional altars from other artists that were in the show because everybody was coming either from different parts of the united states and also mexico and doing more of the traditional uh, altars and here's one that we, again, we did for Avenue 50 Studios. We used a lot of uh, items from Laura's garden and her house. So, and again, we were trying to do something different and something Laura would want. The, the, ta uh, the, the door is actually from the inside of the house that we got, the window as well. And everything else is, again, all from Laura's porch. So yeah, this was a way of just kind of doing, paying respects to Laura. Um, this is what the archive kind of looked like by the end of 2018, 2019, before the pandemic, because we were constantly trying to organize it. To me, it was like, oh my gosh, it's scary because it was so many, in so many different boxes. I had to go, like, it was always hard to go. And then during the pandemic, we were trying to get everything back to do a main inventory. And this is what we did. We finally got everything back into the archive, or to the trust. Uh, this is me and my dad's truck. I was butch that day. I was just getting everything. Sybil and I were like, we could fit it. I'm like, yes, we could fit everything. Um, and then there's the Insani's room that we finally got back and you see how it looks a little different. It's a little flatter, maybe you could say. Uh, and then here's one of the worst frame jobs we've ever seen of Laura's work. This was from the images she had in San Antonio from the Stillness in Motion series. Some framer, some professional framer thought it was cute to put masking tape on the back and then they put, no, not masking, like duct tape and then masking tape on the hit to hinge the photograph to the mat board. So the tape, there's so much tape residue on these. Yeah, it was, and then they use glass instead of plex. It was a nightmare. We had to deframe about 20 images. It was horrible, horrible. Uh, it was, yeah, I'm just going to say horrible. Uh, here again, this is what I've been doing the last couple of years is going through every series and um, inventory, uh, doing just like what's here, what's available, what has been sold, where am I, where's extra stuff. Um, Laura made multiple uh, duplicates of her work and not only larger size, eight by 10, five by seven, some like little far, four by six, some are signed, some are not signed. Yeah, it's been a journey trying to figure out what is, and then just seeing, oh, there's more images. Um, also, again, going to having to print a lot of the work. And this one, this image, what I found out was most institutions, if they buy color prints, they also require an archival copy. 
uh, this in particular institution was freaking out because they didn't think that I can match the original print because you know they thought oh well you need the same printer you need this and I'm like you can use any kind of this printer with the same inks and make the same copies I'm like digital final copies but whatever I don't want to name the names but yeah so it was a major institution was doing it so I had to do that for that but I was like you're going to pay me to do this work because it is work I had to find a printer and uh, an institution was open during this time and this is the pandemic like hey can I go in and sneak in and do these prints and of course I matched them. And then when I sent the work to them, they're like, oh yeah, you're right. And I was like, of course I'm right. But you would never question, you know, somebody was non-white, but again, I digress. So here again, this is a nicer a version of what a, a nice frame job would look like and how it's easy to take it apart. Um, so we had, again, we had to do, uh, this is from the show and tell exhibition. We had to kind of take apart the work because we need to put it for the inventory. And a lot of, uh, for acquisitions, a lot of institutions rather have the work unframed because it saves on money with frame. You know, if it's in frame, then they have to insure it. It's all the big hassle, but if you do it unframed, you could pack it easily and it's cheaper and it's lightweight and it could get there faster. And FedEx has been a godsend in this whole two years, getting the work to all the institutions that I've worked with. As long as they pay for it because you know they should be paying for it they have the budget for that um and but now we're at the final uh stretch i know i'm sorry i've been talking a lot but i can talk a lot about laura i want to show you this video that i did with laura in 2017 we went to joshua tree this is when laura took myself and sybil and showed us where she wanted to be want her ashes to be spread but at the same time i was just doing documentation because i didn't know and i'll leave you with this let's play it so let's we'll see if you could try yeah Um, it looks like Peter has a question. Um, how Mexican is Mexican work reminds me of the Day of the Dead ofrendas. Was this an important celebration for Laura? Uh, yes, actually it was. She did, She loved um, going to any of the celebrations, for example, like Self-Help Graphics in Los Angeles, East LA. Uh, she did photograph a lot of that, um, like going around to like different celebrations. She would also go to other Day of the Dead um, exhibitions around LA in, in the 80s and 90s. She would go a little bit in the 2000s and then she kind of stopped because, you know, it's just as she got older, it was hard for her to kind of go be around a lot of places and people because the hearing she had, like her hearing was just getting a little bit uh, worse by the end. And but she in the beginning, she loved going. She she documented all that. And I, yeah, in this work in particular, how Mexico, you could see that because she had items from every person of the, every model. And they just had, it's like a little knickknack saying, this is who I am. This is, um, I don't know if all the people got their stuff back <laughs> after so long, but yeah, it's, it's something that's, and especially Day of the Dead, 
there's another body of work she did of like the self-help uh, graphics um, celebration of Day of the Dead. And it's all these just like more documentary photographs of just people and like dancing with the makeup and all that. And that's from 1984. And that's the only thing we have. But I have there's some other images of like just when she went around, she just took some simple digital pictures. So awesome. I think you could see that in a lot of her other work too, this like offering in some way in her work, but it's not as prevalent as these two uh, bodies of work. Okay, we have another question. Um, noticing the shift in her work, much of Aguilar's earlier work centers around the intersection of her queer and Chicanx identity. Towards the end of her work, it centers around nature and less of social identity. I'm wondering if you can speak more on this contrast. Maybe she never cared about identity and the structure of identity in the first place. Ooh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, thank you uh, for asking that. You know, yes, I think in the beginning, there was this uh, emphasis on trying to find out her identity, like for the, the portraits and then the, you know, Latina lesbians, the Bush Plenty, everything to a certain extent, like maybe up to like 1996 when she went into the, the nude to nature with nature self-portrait. I think it also her trying to figure out where she stands in a lot of like herself. And again, working with Laura and talking to her I think I, I, cause I met her in like 2003. So I think she was kind of maybe transitioning out of this like identity politics uh, work and more going into more spirituality because I think when she got to the like 2000s and beyond she was more spiritual, more trying to find like a more inner peace. And I think that's where, like I think you nailed, nailed it on the, where, you know, she was not caring about it much but it was just something that she was not really it was not something important to her anymore because I think she kind of worked through that and she found her identity but then I think she was trying to find more spirituality and and, and peace inner peace with you know herself her body um, a lot of the grief she had and death in her life uh, and I think that's where the nudes come into her work. And, but it's funny because I think the nudes are still very also about identity in some way, but I think she didn't really think about that herself. I think others will probably say that. And myself, I, I think she, she was more, again, more about spirituality, more about what it means for herself to just be and, um, and finding happiness. Cause I think, because in, in 1996 is when she first started getting into uh, antidepressants. And it was the first time she found happiness in that way because growing up, she was always depressed or having these de dark depressive uh, uh, periods in her life. So that was her kind of getting away and then being naked too was kind of like a freeing thing. And I think when you're you're dealing with like work that is more about like the community and uh, your Chicana identity and being lesbian, it's like your clothes and how we dress and how we present is like, it's tiring because, you know, after this, I'm just gonna change and put into a normal shirt. But I think for her, it was the same thing. Being nude was a, her way of freedom in a way. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, I mean, of course we could talk more about it and, or you could find me on Instagram and email me. Um, yeah, so, uh, or should I answer? Because I saw another question. Go for it. Uh, does Laura, does she have connections with other women feminist artists? Does she know Anna Anamadia's work? And thanks so much for sharing. Oh yeah, she was absolutely knew about Anna's work and she knew, and she did work with other feminist uh, artists. Like I said, um, uh, Delilah Montoya, who's another Chicana, um, oh, yeah, feminist of photographer as well. Um, a lot of the women artists too were also in a way feminist. Uh, she, she knew a lot of artists at the time too, um, like the who's who in the 80s and 90s, like Barbara Carrasco too. Um, she was also part of like the Women's Center, I believe. I think that's the one. Yeah, there's the Women's Center. She did a lot of community work outreach with them as well. The LGBT uh, Center here in Los Angeles, she did a lot of, uh, she had a residency there in, the in 1992. And she did a lot of like work with them. She also taught some classes. 
So she was meeting all these uh, different people, worked with different artists. Um, I think, again, as she got older, she kind of, not I want to say recluse, but she kind of was like, didn't want to work with a lot of people. She got a little bit more moody. I mean, I, I'm going to I'm gonna say it. And it's like she got moody and she didn't like working with people. But in the beginning, she did. And she 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 knew a lot of people knew people knew her. But as you know, and then with the dialysis going, you know, and the sickness, I think it just kind of like made her more inward and more like kind of antisocial. So yeah, she she was a fan of Anna's work. And she would always, when we talked about Anna too, she would like, oh, I love Anna, but that fucking asshole of her, you know, that husband who killed her. And I'm like, yeah, 100%. So she, she knew, of, she knew, she knew about them. So, yeah. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, you talked about how photography found her. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, like how, how that came to her and then a little bit about her like technical skill in the dark room and with printing and whatnot. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cause with photography, when she was growing up again, she didn't really have like any way because she was dyslexic and had all these learning disabilities. She didn't have a way to communicate and it took her brother to build her a dark room and give her a camera that she, she just, it was like given to her. And then she just, it was like instant that she found photography and then photography also found her because she started taking pictures and she was natural, she was such a natural at it. She understood about, you know, exposure, uh, developing, she did everything herself. And it was just like, you know, like peanut butter and jelly, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, uh, it, it was so like, cause she just got better and better with her work. And she was like, she she took a high school photo class, I believe uh, in 1977 or 78 before she graduated. And again, I think that just made things easy for her. After that, like, you know, and then she was taking classes at, when she was taking class at East LA College, uh, she, were, she found, uh, her mentor at the time too, which was May Valenzuela, who later became my mentor. So it was kind of this crazy like circle. Yeah. And then at the same time, she also met Sybil Vaginetis, who took who was teaching Chicano studies at the time too. And then Sybil and I, I took classes with Sybil too. So again, there's this really fun connection of all of us. May was because I now I know this because with May, when it was May was my mentor, she was like really strict and taught taught me a lot about photography and like how to print and like you know and I go oh that means she did the same with Laura because Laura would say the same and she's like oh may kick my butt yeah. may would make me redo everything you know understand why the chemistry this that the paper but also the the thing that we both like learned from May too is that you know we have to make sure the work is so it's done almost perfectly that nobody could question your technique and they have to look at your subject matter. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with Laura and myself too, but in a different way of what, you know, how I look at uh, photography and what it's supposed to, to say and whatnot. But for Laura, that was her biggest thing. She was constantly printing, constantly printing, because I think as a, as a young photographer, when you're learning, especially darkroom printing, you're gonna go in there, you gotta make mistakes, you gotta keep on doing it to the point that you're you're so like it becomes obsessive and I think that's where because another instructor of mine too at Kellart said this he goes until you know how to do a perfect print and you put in quotations then you know you could do whatever you want but if you can't do that in the beginning you know you can't really like have work that you really want to say because people are going to look at it and say oh it's to this it's to that and then you're like no it's about like the work is about like something else you're like I can't look beyond that yeah. And that's what Laura was always telling me too. When we would sit down, she's like, you know, she's, I, she went, we'll go to shows and she's like critiquing the hell out of a photograph. She's like, oh, they could have done this. They could have done that. And it's funny because I do that same thing now. <laughs> or even when I teach, I'm always like telling students, oh, it could be better. Yeah. And they get upset. But then later on, they tell me like, no, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, you just want to be somewhere else because, you know, Laura didn't have it easy either. Like oh, there's other like artists that are who are white and doing like bare minimal work and people are just clapping mm -hmm. where, you know, they, they're gonna question, uh, you know, a woman and her work. So, yeah. and I think that's what, you know, Laura was 
so keen and and I call Laura a master photographer now because okay. she did all her work except for the grounded series because originally Willie Middlebrook was doing that work he helped print that and then I came along and did that work so I was like you know trying to do pay my respects to both artists who were you know master at in printing and I was like okay <laughs> I have a lot to live up to but then Laura was like no you don't you just have to do what you know what do you think is right so she gave me that you know saying you can do it just you know yeah so it, it, it was hard matching to a lot of her printing because again paper and chemistry is not the same anymore uh at the time when I was doing it back in 2016 2017 you know sitting there and then I would fight with Laura about the, in the dark room it's like you know she's like oh it's too dark it's too light and I was like well you know it's gonna dry and she's like no <laughs> just going over like fiber-based papers and you know just but that was good it was good you know for myself too yeah. so yeah awesome. thank you um one last question I know you talked about this a little bit some of your favorite works but maybe if you could remind us which ones were your favorites um hmm. I know you I know you mentioned there's two. I mean okay. there's there's so many there's so right. many different works but for me the first one would be in Sandy's room mm -hmm. yeah in Sandy's room is like the iconic for me uh the second one would be center number 100 which I I think I put here this is like for me the most it's just something about it it's different than all the other works of, in nature mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Grounded, mm -hmm. this one in particular. And again, because I, I said that this was, my, I used this in my thesis and talked about, you know, deathbed and mm -hmm. the work I did in, inspired by Laura and kind of paying respects was kind of in, inspiration from this image. So those are kind of like the, the main ones. And yeah. <laughs> there's so many different other ones and like, yeah. you know, depending on your mood and where yeah. you're at. But I think these are like my favorite and are they're important to me as, as an artist too as well well i hope everyone um enjoyed the talk thank you so much christopher um follow laura on instagram um for all the more images and um updates on what the trust is doing and i hope you all have a great afternoon or evening depending on where you are and thank you again so much yes thank you again for having me i gotta go drink some cameo tea my <laughs> but thank you again and hope to see everybody soon after this pandemic okay.